The Center for Constitutional Rights was founded in November 1966 by attorneys Morton's Davis, Arthur Kenoy, Ben Smith, and William Kunstler. Their legal work representing civil rights activists in Mississippi convinced them of the need for a privately funded legal center. This center would undertake innovative impact litigation on behalf of popular movements for social justice. The history of CCR since its founding reflects the history of the legal battles of the many social movements, organizations, and individuals whose constitutional rights have been denied or attacked. CCR is not merely a legal organization. CCR was born out of the Southern Civil Rights Movement, and the whole conception of the organization was that the law would go hand in hand with the social movements, the political activity. Mississippi was one of the most segregated states, one of the most dangerous states, if you were a black person living in the South. I mean, every form of intimidation possible were used against black people in the South who wanted to vote. What uh, Morty did was he went there and spent a whole, I don't know, summer, six months, something like that, gathering the affidavits of people who had tried to register to vote and were refused. Then uh, Miss Fannie Lou Hamer and her group uh, went to Washington, D.C. Uh, with those affidavits and challenged the seating of the Mississippi delegation. So Congress amazingly and historically held up the seating of the Mississippi delegation there for several days and then within months uh, passed the Voting Rights Act. Because of the critical need for justice in the South, CCR created an office in Mississippi to address voting rights and other civil rights issues throughout the 1990s. In addition to CCR South, the center has continued the battle for racial, social, and economic justice, bringing attention to the movements through litigation and campaigns. Back in 19... Um 79, the Ku Klux Klan had emerged once again as a force of reaction to support the disaffected and those who felt they were being pushed aside by the march of civil rights. They were literally sweeping across the South and the nation in robes as if they were a church society. So CCR and a group of other organizations came together to figure out how can we address this deep problem. Well, the Crumsey case, we, we created a legal task force with a lot of different legal groups to work on these Klan cases. Mrs. Crumsey and three or four other uh, ladies had gone to, I think they'd gone to the movies or something, and they were walking home, and a Klan group shot at them. Didn't kill anyone, but shot at them on the street. The Klansmen were arrested immediately, um, brought to trial, charged with um, serious crimes, felonies, one was convicted of assault, served six months of a nine-month sentence. The other two were acquitted of all charges. And so we said to them we would represent them against this Klan group. We came up with a statute, still in the books. It was passed in 1871. It was called the Ku Klux Klan Act. Um, it created a federal cause of action, a federal lawsuit remedy for the victims of Klan violence. No one had ever used this statute to sue the Klan. We decided that's what we were going to do. And we won and brought a very large judgment against that Klan group, basically wiped it out. What the case showed us at CCR was that you could win these kind of cases, even in the Deep South. And as a result of the work we did in Crumsey, we put together a book entitled Racially Motivated Violence Litigation Strategies. And it was essentially a catalog of how we did it in the Crumsey case. To this day, there are lawyers in the South who still use the book and still use our techniques. And the, and the model that we, we developed. Since the 70s, women's rights have been at the heart of CCR's work, whether it be now v. Terry, which was the first case to establish a buffer zone around abortion clinics, or the landmark case, Monell v. Department of Social Services, which forced local government accountability for unconstitutional acts for the first time. CCR maintains its strong commitment to bring attention to and challenge the injustices that affect the lives of women both here and abroad. We have to look back to the late 1960s and early 1970s when we think about 
CCR's involvement in women's rights. There were women lawyers doing good things in the National Lawyers Guild and other areas, but there were no legal organizations at that point that were focusing on issues of women's rights. After Roe v. Wade was decided, the anti-abortion movement was looking for ways in which they could limit or stop abortions. They made one of their targets Medicaid reimbursement for abortion. And so we sued, saying that abortion was a fundamental right and that fundamental rights ought to be funded because whether you choose pregnancy or whether you choose abortion, you're exercising the same right. You can't fund one and not the other. In the McRae case, she, Rhonda put together a brilliant, brilliant record. She developed really important theories. She, her arguments in the Supreme Court were extraordinary. What came out of the case in many ways was a lot of public consciousness about the unfairness and the danger of restricting Medicaid for poor women and the religious nature of the anti-abortion movement. To this day, CCR continues to expand the scope of international human rights law. This work includes targeting paramilitary leaders such as Radovan Karadzic and Emmanuel Toto Constant, as well as multinational corporations that callously ignore and violate basic tenets of human rights in order to maximize profit. Joelito Filartica, who is the son of Joel Filartica, a doctor and a radical opponent of the Stroessner regime in Paraguay, was taken one night from his home and tortured to death. My brother was killed by a Stroessner. He was the one who said, give the order. Dali Filartiga discovered, and the family discovered, that the um, torturer was here uh, in New York. We called an emergency meeting, and we said, listen, folks, this is the case we've been waiting for ever since we discovered the Alien Tort Claims Act at the time of the My Lai Massacre during the Vietnam War. Someone, and we don't remember who it was, had discovered the statute called the Alien Tort Claims Act, enacted in 1789 as part of the first Judiciary Act that says an alien um, has a right to sue for tort only uh, in violation of the law of nations. People said, wait, wait a minute. They said, you're going to sue a Paraguayan in Brooklyn for an act of torture committed in Paraguay, and you're going to do this on behalf of Paraguayan plaintiffs? And Rhonda Copeland and I said, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Because we can't give refuge to a human rights violator, because your wrongs travel with you wherever you go. This is part of the theory of the case. Your wrongs travel with you, and it doesn't matter if you cross boundaries, you don't get impunity from boundaries. When I talk about Peter and Rhonda and, and all of them, and, and my heart gets, uh, I don't know how to express. Uh, it's like they saved me. I, I owe my life to them. To be perfectly modest about it, I think it's conceivably the most important human rights case of the last uh, 30 years or so. Because it is the precursor to what is now referred to as universal jurisdiction, which means that some crimes are so heinous that they should be subject to trial in any country in the world. In the 1980s, that principle was expanded to include people who had command responsibility. And then in the 1990s, um, the principle was expanded to allow suits against multinational corporations. If a multinational corporation aids and abets um, violations of international law, such as torture, genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, then they also should be held accountable. Defending civil rights often involves aggressively confronting the government, compelling it to abide by the law, and to refrain from egregious abuses of power. CCR has dramatically expanded its work in this area and is leading the challenge against the current administration's flagrant contempt for the rule of law and human rights. The central teaching of our own history has been that arbitrary general searches and seizures Always, but 
always, and that is the teaching and the meaning of the essence of our experience as a people, is the path to the assertion of tyrannical control over the lives of people. In the late 60s, uh, and going into the early 70s, there was a period of massive anti-war resistance in this country, and there were demonstrations everywhere. The country was really, in the most positive sense, coming apart. You had Richard Nixon as president, uh, and you had John Mitchell as the Attorney General of the United States. And they were insisting on the fact that as the executive power, that they could essentially, an argument we hear today, do whatever they wanted to people within a certain framework. With U.S. v. District Court was at stake whether the executive, acting on his own, could bypass the Fourth Amendment, which requires probable cause, and bypass a court and just engage in direct wiretapping in the, quote, name of national security, um, and wiretap whoever, whomever I want. We won district court. We won the case, and it was a major victory because it said that the president could not on his own wiretap American citizens. And of course, it's the same precise arguments that are being made today by the administration, and not just arguments, but actions taken pursuant to those arguments. And so again today, in the warrantless wiretapping case, which the Center for Constitutional Rights has pending, we have again challenged the president's authority in the name of war to engage in national security wiretapping against U.S. citizens. In the 1980s, the Reagan administration was engaged in various illegal interventions in Central America. And when Salvadorans and Guatemalans ultimately tried to get into the United States claiming that they should get political asylum, um, the United States would not give it to them. They were discriminating against Salvadorans and Guatemalans because we were supporting those right-wing regimes. And so church people throughout the country, they started the equivalent of an underground railroad. They started a movement whereby they helped Salvadorans and Guatemalans come into the United States. They sent them um, to various places around the country to live, to have jobs. We decided to file a case. It's called American Baptist Churches versus Thornburg. Uh, what uh, the ABC case was designed to do was to be, be an offensive challenge, where in fact people were coming forward uh, before the court, taking an affirmative step uh, to challenge the government's policies um, on behalf of a very broad range of different political and religious organizations. And the result has been quite remarkable. It's one of those CCR cases where we actually win. The uh, idea behind the settlement was to uh, demand and require that the United States essentially reconsider these political asylum applications that they had denied. And many Salvadorans and Guatemalans were allowed to apply for political asylum. There was something called a movement support network doing work around uh, Central America issues. The idea is to create a safe space where people can come and then have a conversation about what are we doing? What's, what's our respective work in different areas? And so if you can get together and share information, then out of sharing the information, you may decide that, wait, wait, wait a minute, here's an issue that we can all work on. And then the center is there to provide you know, technical assistance. And I would think the signature work of that in that regard was the work that we did around police brutality and misconduct, which eventually actually led to the street crimes unit being shut down. Uh, we also did uh, work around the church burnings in Atlanta, helping to provide legal assistance and guidance in terms of the defense of uh, these churches and being on the offensive against hate groups. Well, ECLC, uh, the Emergency Civil Liberties Committee, their key mission really was to take, like the center, cases very often that were unpopular, cases that maybe other people would not do. There came a time when actually uh, it appeared that the ECLC you know, was prepared to close its doors. Many of us felt that it shouldn't do that that we shouldn't have a situation where our organizations die. Rather than die, why not merge? There will be people who are in ECLC who will become a part of the board of directors of the Center for Constitutional Rights. The organization would still live really through the work of the Center for Constitutional Rights. Family members of some New York State prison inmates are outraged. They say that they're being charged too much to talk to their loved ones, and they say that MCI is behind this collect call controversy. The campaign for telephone justice grew out of the center's relationship with family members of people who were incarcerated, not just in New York State, but throughout the country, who were being charged exorbitant rates to receive collect phone calls from state prisons. There are people that have to make the choice whether or not they're going to accept the calls or, or put food on the table. Because of the multi-pronged approach of the campaign, 
which included not only litigation, but grassroots organizing, providing media training to family members, basically equipping them to stand up. We were able to get our message out in many incarnations to a broad, broad audience of people uh, who responded by showing their support in a number of ways. On January the 8th of 2007, eight days into his administration, uh, Governor Spitzer announced and informed us first, I should add, that he was immediately eliminating the commissions that were derived from these contracts. On all counts, CCR is fighting for the preservation of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Since 9-11, CCR has filed numerous cases challenging this government's utter disregard for these precious guarantors of democracy. We will continue to work tirelessly in the defense of human rights and the rule of law in the United States and around the world. The Center for Constitutional Rights is only a mile, a mile and a half from 9-11, from the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center. We as the center made a decision that knowing what was going to happen, that we would go into the community, work with the uh, Muslim community here in New York and see if we could try to develop a relationship whereby we could uh, be helpful. First there were the roundups of thousands of Muslims and our office started getting calls, where's my husband, where's my brother, where's my father? And you would be lied to by the administration and as it turns out, of course, those people were moved around to different prisons. They were treated as if they were terrorists, even though they were non-citizen, just non-citizen Muslims with no record of terrorism. None of them turned out to be terrorists. Uh, I wake up November 14, 2001, and the president has issued, and it's the front pages of the paper, what's called military order number one. It says the president can pick up any non-citizen anywhere in the world and detain them forever. Without any kind of trial, with any kind of right to a writ of habeas corpus, Fourth Amendment and the Constitution requires that if you're being held in these ways, you're entitled to certain things. You're entitled to be charged with a crime. You're entitled to go in front of a judge and demand that there be evidence. You're entitled to a lawyer. You're entitled to all sorts of things that they weren't getting. So uh, as a result of that activity, that was our first post-9-11 activity. We started a lawsuit that became Turkman versus Ashcroft. Gita Gutierrez is a lawyer who flies regularly from her office at the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York to Guantanamo. Her organization represents about 200 detainees. In early January, it's announced that some people are going to Guantanamo. We knew that when people were sent to Guantanamo, the government's argument was that they're outside of the courts and the government could do whatever they wanted to them. It was that moment when we made the decision that we could, even if it was going to lose us our funding, even if it was going to be difficult for us personally, that we would take these cases. Russell was one of those early cases, and what happened was that we filed a petition for habeas corpus on, on his behalf. And ultimately, the court decided that people who are held at Guantanamo do have a right to go into court and demand habeas corpus. Courts have jurisdiction to hear these, these claims and applications. And so, this is what the Russell case decided, and it was a great case, a landmark case. These people were then called by the President of the United States the worst of the worst. It turns out they were, they were not the worst of the worst. They were, you know, often ordinary people. Can you state that you know categorically that men have been mistreated here at Guantanamo? Absolutely, and I can say that not simply based on client interviews and discussions with my clients about their interrogations or the conditions of confinement over the years at Guantanamo. Um, there have also been things like um, an interrogation log that outlines very clearly the aggressive interrogation tactics used, particularly against one prisoner, uh, that were authorized all the way up the chain of command to Secretary Rumsfeld. And it's not, it's not as though this is really furthering the war on terrorism. It's, but it does maybe make uh, the administration and Bush and Rumsfeld look as though they're doing something. The Guantanamo Global Justice Initiative really came out of this early struggle by a few attorneys and others at the center to bring the first Guantanamo cases. In part, after 2004, we felt it necessary to set up really within the center a group of lawyers and legal workers and assistants who would really ensure that every single person at Guantanamo had counsel, 
that we were working together, uh, and that we would also not just give them legal counsel, but that we would deal with the families overseas, deal with people's refugee status, deal with access to the lawyers. It's probably the proudest moment of the center that I've been in. We knew that the habeas corpus issue was completely serious. Uh, we were completely right. It was not just Guantanamo. It was Bagram. It was torture. Um, it was rendition, outsourcing torture. It was all of those issues. I still feel like we're, we're outposts uh, in the world, in this country, but I do feel we have a lot more support. CCR staff and lawyers are uniquely talented and deeply committed to political and social justice. They are individuals who passionately believe in the basic rights provided by our Constitution and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They are dedicated to providing a voice to the voiceless and to supporting progressive movements seeking equality and fairness. For the last 20 years, CCR has trained the next generation of people's lawyers through its renowned Ella Baker Internship Program. Each summer, students work alongside CCR attorneys on their active cases and participate in an array of relevant educational and social events. Ella Baker had started her career in the 40s. She worked for the NAACP. She was the one who taught people. The leadership of a community does not depend on uh, degrees, on education it, that ordinary people have within themselves tremendous power if they only realize it. Ella Baker interns come and work very, very hard for very little credit. So they come, uh, they, they work long, long hours, uh, as do the CCR lawyers, creating briefs and, and developing work. And so the students are right there alongside them, uh, doing research, helping to write briefs, uh, going out to uh, investigate various things, but the students uh, play a huge role. When I was in Ella Baker, I learned that the practice of law and service to and support of progressive movements were inextricably linked. If you're practicing law outside of a movement context, then you're really only interested in the advance of law. The goal here that I think that came through, came through on the Ella Baker program, and is certainly true today, is that it is about the people, and it's not about the institution of law. That's why we do what we do. Being a people's lawyer was the most important thing, and it will be as we move forward. Where you have governments that uh, don't respect the rights of the people, that think that corporate money is more important than the ability of an individual to lead their lives, where people are characterized racially, um, in terms of gender, in terms of sexuality. When you have those things in place, as you have had for the last 40 years, there will always be two things. There will always be dissenters, people who will speak out against that uh, individually and collectively. When they speak out collectively, there will be movements, social justice movements, that are striving and working very hard on the streets. And as long as those two things are there, you're always going to have a CCR who's working on both fronts to make sure that the basic constitutional and basic values enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are advanced. When you ask yourself, should I support CCR, you should really ask yourself, what do I believe in? What values are important to me? What kind of society do I want to live in? And if you want to live in a society where people are not tortured in the name of the government, in your name, you should support CCR. If the rule of law, the international rule of law, means anything to you, if you think that the United States should hold itself accountable under the international rule of law, you should support CCR. If you want to live in a society where people of color are treated with dignity and respect, then you want to support CCR. If you don't think that people should be picked up off the street and sent to other countries to be tortured in our government's name, you should support CCR. If you think that the right to dissent the right to criticize your government is an important right. You should support CCR. And when the government seeks to repress that dissent, you should support CCR.